Hello and welcome to Cardiff Central Podcast. Uh, I'm back in the hot seat today, so as ever, I'm Harley. And once again, I'm joined by Carwin. How are you doing, buddy? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad at all. I've, I've uh, unlike other pods in this brand, we normally don't drink, do we? But today I feel there's a good reason to drink, which I'm sure we'll mention in a couple of minutes. But um, yeah, I thought I'd start on the, whatever I'm on, the Indian pale ale or some some kind of something. Excellent shout, yeah. Uh, and uh, now I feel now I feel uh, inadequate because I've got some uh, Pepsi Max with lime, <laughs> just to, just to get that extra bit of sling into my life. <laughs> um. So before we go in, so it's a bit of a slower week for news, and um, with the main with the first team not being not playing this weekend, um, so we've got a little bit more time to talk about our our weekend. So did you uh, watch any any live games of rugby in person yeah. this weekend? I did uh, not not anything on, on well top level. I, I it was very high quality, mind you, despite the weather. Which was uh, I went down to watch Sandoff North against Pontyclean Women. Um, really good game. Pontyclean were on top in the first half. It seemed uh, Sophie Peters in the centre. She was absolutely superb. Um, she she was uh, a few people were, were noticing her and giving her a name check as as she was playing. And um, Pontyclean, I thought. Look, the stronger side. It seemed to be that Sandaf just couldn't get any dominance, um, and then they started to come into the game. They packed particularly, so the backs weren't quite clicking. And then the second half, they managed to pull away. Uh, Sandaf North winning nineteen points to fifteen in the end, which, considering the conditions, was pretty good. Going to score a couple of tries in the second half when it was full in storm or what, whichever the first storm of the weekend was. I've, I've, I lose track by now, but. Yeah, brilliant game of rugby, high quality. Um, number of players that were involved with uh, Gwalia and Brick on Thunder, the likes of Charlie Mundy, for instance, playing for Pontyclean. So really good to see. And um, yeah, can highly recommend going down to Haley Bark to watch Land of North in the future. Uh, excellent stuff. And uh, as I said, I think there's quite a few uh, famous Cardiff alum hailing from from that area, but uh, we, won't, we won't go into that into that sort of <laughs> thing. Um, so... First bit of news. So we move on to the news. There's not really. There's only two bits of news. One of them, good, but you know, not, not, not to the same scale as the other bit of news. So if we go to, first of all, and that is, Cardiff Rugby are terrible at releasing signing videos, but the good news is they've su- we've re-signed Mackenzie Martin, and you know, even a very dodgy McDonald's reference isn't going to spoil that for me. No, it did spoil it for me. No, I'm joking. I, you know, it's great news, isn't it? It's great news, and that's the that's three of the four um, new caps or uncapped players, sorry, I should say, in the Wales squad that have been signed the new longer term contracts. And how great news that is as well. Um, you know, the cynical side of me sees it and thinks, well, you know, get them while they're while they they're not demanding higher paid contract. But the the the, the practical matter of it is they are going to be commodities, and they are quality players. So let's be honest about it. Um, so to get get those three and hopefully hopefully Evan can uh, stay around for a while as well, it'd be great to see him having a long term future at the club. So yeah, can't, can't speak highly enough of 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 that of that bit of business to get Mackenzie alongside Man and win it to the long term contract. I'm sure Harley backs that as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I you you know you've just the talents of them. I mean, regardless of the Wales aspirations, which you know it's always great to see our players. Being selected for national honours, just knowing that you know these young promising players are choosing to stay with the cap, at least during this formative time in their career, which yes, a it's quite nice because we get them a little bit cheaper than if you do what some people say Scarlet did, where they let players go to Jersey and Cornish Pirates and then pay for them to come back as senior players. That seems like a false economy to me. So let's get them up, get them through their twenty five caps, and if they want to move away, you know, in big bucks, you know, great. But let's keep them when they're in this sort of Prime, prime being moulded in a full Cardiff way, um, you know, and then as long as we can keep the pathway going, which we should be good. And I suppose I said we're gonna. I feel like we're gonna be rattling through tonight anyway. So, um, you know, going to the big big news today. Which do you want to take the lead on this one? Uh, yeah. Well, the big big news today came out last night at a ridiculous time. To be honest, that's that's the other thing to mention. But that Helford Capital have, um, well. 
the, the proposal to go through with purchasing the club has gone through. It went through with a 99.99% vote from the shareholders, which is well, pretty comprehensive to say the least. I want to know who that 0.01% is, but anyway, very comprehensive deal. And yeah, they purchased 84.55%, uh, so obviously controlling stake in the club, uh, in the region, sorry, brilliant news. Obviously, it's been something that's been touted, expected, whatever word you want to use for, for a while. So they finally have it finalised and their statement coming in the last hour really re reiterates their, their pledge to, to, to help the region. And, you know, I, I think having spoken to people that know, have, you know, haven't spoken, I haven't spoken to them personally, but haven't spoken to people that have spoken to them, they seem really dedicated to rugby, really dedicated to improving um, the Cardiff Farms Park and the, the rugby experience as well as, as the academy, etc. So that's that's something that can only be commended and hopefully all that proves to be true and comes out in fruition because, um, yeah, lots of things need to be improved. We know that and obviously there's financial difficulties behind, but it's great to have a backer now after some brilliant years with the Thomas family and someone else to continue their legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also if Phil and Neil want to you know, feel like they want a platform to to share with the fans. They're more than welcome to come on this pod to the cast any any time they like if they're listening. And if they're not, and you know Phil and Neil, feel free to point them in our direction. And you know they can decide uh, whether or not they want to in the space. Uh it does go into it does lead me into one of the few listeners' questions we've had over the, that sort of dripped in over the weekend. Um, I apologize, I haven't got the name to it, but they were talking about what do you think their priorities are. Now I feel like we've discussed this at length um, when the news first broke but I mean mm. for me it's got to be about on the rug on the rugby side is securing what is already good so our path you know um, in Phil and Neil's statement they said about how they want to secure and improve the fact that you know we are the second largest pathway or you know we have the second largest number of players tuning through um, up to international left compared to you know second only to Leinster uh, I, I feel like that at least in Europe, I don't. I said I think the South Africans have something to say about that, but you know, yeah. So I think we need to make sure these pathways are good. Try and strengthen links with the likes of Cardiff Uni, Cardiff Met, Uni South Wales. Um, the world's talks about bridging with Clifton College and the likes of Gloucester Harpry. So academy prospects who wanted to go and do their studying up in those institutions could could and still stay contracted to us. So I think that's going to be a first. Um, they're not, you know, making sure we've got top end of training facilities. So the um, is it Lan is it the Lanishan or the Pentwin Leisure Centre? Um, yeah. yeah. So make sure they, you know, that is as good as anything. So so basically, we're giving our players no excuses on that end. And then I think the final thing, which it is, you know, they're very big on trying to make Cardiff a more sustainable club. So it's not so they're not relying on having to constantly put money in. Is you know redeveloping the Cardiff Arms Park. Now I think as part of this thing, Cardiff Athletic Club have gotten some more heritage shares. I think now I don't know how they work. I think we'll have to get someone like Lynn, Lynn on on the podcast again. So hopefully she can help explain that sort of thing. Um, but from my understanding is they get veto rights on certain things like having Cardiff, you know what colours we play in. You know this Cardiff has to be in the team name and things like that. But if that if that helps get the redevelopment through, so we can actually have it. One is a fantastic place for people to go and experience rugby, but also to be used on non-rugby days. Then, you know, those are the days where we're going to generate income that we don't necessarily, you know, we wouldn't otherwise. And I think, you know, and that's what's going to help us when we can start bringing up our salary cap. Then we can start bringing in big names or retaining the higher internationals. I think, um, you know, there were other questions about, oh, you know, well, you know, would they be willing to put in for these marquee players? I think it's the wrong time now. I think yeah. now is consolidate what we have, then build. Because the problem yeah. is when you go Galacticos, it doesn't always work. If you look at the likes of Bristol and Racing 92 and Toulon, fantastic, huge, huge money players, and then nothing really happens. Well, I, I think Toulon would argue about the, the three Champions Cups. But, you know, at the same time, I think, I think, I, I do see a point that there needs, it's the infrastructure that needs to come first. And it's that development of, an improvement of what is already there, which is clearly a working pathway. We've, as we've spoken about, the consistency of seeing four and cap players in the Wales squad, ex along with seven other players in that squad that are kind of based to have 
have a better pathway, a better system going through, better training facilities. I do think that needs to come in. I think that's important. Um, uh, having you know seen 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 what's there, and I think that needs to be developed on and improved upon. Um, and then hopefully um, the redevelopment of CAP uh, to some extent that was something some improvements there well everyone knows there needs to be improvements there but i understand that's a bit more of a difficulty situation with its proximity to not only town but the the principality stadium so um yeah obviously those are huge things that need to be looked at and then i think you're looking at once those infrastructure things are in place and improved upon you've hopefully by then established a better team and therefore, you can bring in your marquee players that will want to join the club. And perhaps um, it won't just be the monetary offer that you can offer them that will be tempting them. It'll be the offer of playing at a high quality team with a number of youngsters and, well, players like Mackenzie Martin, who'll be two, three years down the line and better for it and in a position where they're playing international rugby week in, week out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I said I think when we, I feel like there's not really much more to say that we haven't already said in the past, and you know we can keep going over this in layers. But it, either way, it's this is you know another a promise, you know another promising layer. It's what has at times been frustrating, but overall has been actually quite an encouraging season for us this season. Yeah, yeah, that's you know we're often touted as being negative, but I think. Of the four regions, uh, obviously performances on the pitch, you speak of Ospreys, especially after their brilliant result on the weekend. But I think all the positivity that's going around Cardiff is brilliant and it's all future positivity as well. It's not necessarily a one-track season. You know, yes, Thomas has gone, but keeping the likes of Mann, um, Mackenzie Martin and Winnet, hopefully Brady as well, that's brilliant news. And then you've got the purchase. Then you've got possibly redevelopment. They're all building blocks for a future, which is what um, this season has to be. And uh, we've seen that on the pitch. Hopefully we can see it elsewhere as well. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just really positive to talk about, isn't it? And, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I've normally been the negative one, and I may be going into the negative later on in this pod, but um, at least we can talk about a few positives at the, uh, at the start as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I said I, th- I think it's just you know nice, nice little um thing to get to get you to the last of January blues. Um, you you mentioned Wales squad, so one thing that did slip when I said we've we've got four Blue and Blacks playing in the Wales under twenty squad. So Harry Wild, Lucas Delarue, and I've gotten the other two because I'm really bad at this. Yes, likewise. I will. I'll, I'll do a quick uh, Google to see if I can find. Yeah, so you, you should do that. But either way, I mean, all right, it's not as many as for the Wales squad, and you know, but it's still all in. It's it's encouraging that we do have. You know, we are continuing to pump these these players through. Um. Yeah, and whilst you're doing that, I'm trying to think of other points to make. As you can tell, yeah. we have it. Yeah. The one thing on Harry Wild is I'm hearing a lot about him and I would like to see a bit more of him. I just, yes. That's a s- small point, but I've heard a lot of how promising a prospect he is. So I'm very excited by the prospect of seeing him in an under-20s jersey. I'd like to see a bit more of him around the Cardiff rugby yeah. system. Um, Matty Young and Cody Stone are the other two. Oh, to those mention. are those. Um, I knew those are both, young. Both, both, both backs. Um, so yeah, those two to mention, obviously, uh, as well as Delarue and Wild. But yeah, obviously we know what Delarue can do both at the uh, the under twenties level and hard rugby level, as he was proved really really well in the last couple of months. But uh, he's one to look out for. Um, uh, another one name to mention is Evan Wood, who's with Cardiff Met. Um, obviously, yes, not quite with the Blue and Backs, but. Um, one a name to mention for the future, hopefully, as we mentioned about those pathways earlier about having yeah. stronger connections with Cardiff Met and Cardiff Uni. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just uh, just want to put our condolences out to Ryan Woodman for the injury he sustained, so which means he's no, he's um, unfortunately captain, and that's been passed to his Dragons teammate Harry Eckerman. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's just always shit because I thought he's been playing really well, well for the Dragons. 
And yeah, yeah, probably the only I'd say probably the only player who's come close to the sort of Alex Mann's format in the six jersey of the Wales qualified sixes anyway. Yeah, our Bosbury fans are meant to Reese Davis, but whether or not he's a natural six or just playing there, I don't like. I don't like it. And <laughs> yeah. I know, uh, I know, Ga- I know, and Gav from uh, from Dragons Lair would be banging on that drum as well. That you know, Lee's second row is in the second row. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd mention it, but I knew Harley was going to come down like a ton of bricks. But yeah, I, I what Woodman's been superb this season. Um, it was very enjoyable to do the pod yesterday, however, with although we don't want to see any get injured, doing it with Yeston, who's been banging the Harry Ackerman drum for about two years. So he, he was rather smug at seeing um, a player he's been banging the drum up, getting the opportunity to be captain, which is brilliant to see. And his, his form, especially for the region now, has been brilliant enough, considering he's had some brilliant years with uh, Newport in the past as well. So um, another pathway player that, you know, for them, that's great to hear about. Yeah, that's it. So I do, I do like to, I, as much as I, I like to take the piss out of the uh, the other three, you know, I do, I do like to also help raise us all up when we've got players doing particularly well. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's the majority of the news. The other, the other bit of news probably to mention is the EDC situation, um, which yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's 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 an odd one. So. For for right, well, I'll, I'll give a bit of backstory, which is obviously the EDC is the Elite Development co- Competition, which um, is meant to be a new competition set up with eight to ten teams, re- semi replacing the Indigo Premiership. They, it's a focus on those players between the ages of twenty to twenty five, having those players and developing them to become regional and internationals. You know, those you know, a player they constantly talked about was the Jack Morgan being lost from the regional game, going back to Aberavon and coming back and having that pathway for those players who perhaps don't make it initially at regional level, get dropped down and then come back. Um, initially, it was a sign-on process uh, and the majority of the clubs signed up, but Cardiff, Ponty and Merthyr didn't sign up. Uh, Steph Thomas from Wales Online, who, uh, well, you've had him on the rap, haven't you? We've had him on um, the, the the Welsh podcast as well. Um, did, a, did a piece yesterday, I believe, about how Cardiff and Ponty had signed up for the EDC, but a late bid in to try and sign up for it. Um, Ponty have now denied that uh, in, in, I think, the last 24 hours. They put out a statement online, just short, sharp statement, saying that they haven't put a late bid in. And Cardiff haven't yet commented on it. It's the ball a bit of a mess. Um, and it's it, the initial statement from all three was around the lines of they were worried about the salary caps and the salary issues that they would have with going into the EDC. Um, I think the obvious concern is do you miss out on the opportunity if you don't take part? Um, and what what is the, then your situation? But yeah, it's it's all a bit of a mess now, isn't it, Ali? Yeah, I mean the other one that they were worried about is because um the EDC would be a condent a much more condensed format. They'd be losing games from home games. I mean that's a, a topic that's always um on the minds of most rugby fans, although I feel like we've got to accept that. We're only ever gonna we're only gonna get to a certain level of home games again with just how congested the whole calendar is and play things, which is why it's always great with place with like Cardiff rugby season ticket, you get the rags games for free and you get the age grey games tacked on you know, well most of them tacked on for season ticket. I think they had a triple header for the women for the girls under eighteens at Cap and that was three pound to watch three games of rugby, which is fuck all. I barely I probably barely you know, the people who'd have gone there probably didn't pay to have the uh pay for the referees uh expenses. But yeah it's 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 an odd one. I mean, I get what they're saying. I mean, I feel like we almost caught we keep trying to do something along these lines. So a couple of years ago, we had the regional A teams, which didn't quite work because they only they had like three games at the start of the season, three games in the autumn, and then like there was a game later on, and it never really worked. And you know, had the regional select fifteens before that, which were using the Anglo Welsh and the British and Irish League, the old British and Irish League. Um, because I feel I almost feel like it would have been better off if we had set just separate entities so that these long-standing clubs could just carry on with the premiership and they could stay on on their thing and then maybe they have a development side that is based 
and you know, and you do a ground or share type of thing, and you, you know, even if you did call them Ponty, say, say for the cut two Cardiff ones, they just went right, we'll have a Ponty and a Merthyr based one, and then you've got the Rags, which kind of used as a de facto team of that sort of thick style anyway. It, yeah, I mean, we've we be, but I feel like if we're not in the EDC, then that sort of takes it, you know, and would that affect your more so like the Wales? side of things as opposed to coming up to Cardiff because I feel like their pathway they just carry on doing the same thing and then the question is is would the quality of the EDC end up getting much better than the Premiership and then at that point then is it you know are we going to see a much bigger jump for these play for these Cardiff players coming from the rags up and it, I said it's just, it's just all a mess I think the, the clarity and the communications around this from all parties has been really poor because yeah. it took it took too long to to announce who was going to be on the panel, which they still haven't. They've just announced it as a panel. They've no no one specified what the cr- actual criteria are for the eligibility of these clubs. The only one we know about is that they're supposed to be working on a budget of three hundred thousand pounds, but they're not saying if the WRU are going to front up some of that money, or if that's coming from the regional sides themselves, or or, you know, if the clubs themselves are going to have to back, uh, stump it up. And I think that was one of the biggest fears of the three Cardiff regional teams. So I was at the announcement of of the EDC initially, and uh, that happened uh, late August. And the talk was then that it was going to be a period of app- applying between September and December. Now, privately, I'd had conversations with people about certain clubs not making it, surprise clubs not making it, um, on the ground of their their facilities weren't good enough and things like that. And that that was going to be part of it. That performance wasn't going to be factored in. Um was was an interesting one. Obviously got the pump that there was going to be two clubs per region plus a region a, a club in North Wales, which obviously is going to be RGC. So you you then have RGC plus two plus two plus two plus two and another possibly. Um, the situation with Cardiff has made things more difficult. I think the situation with what's going on in Newport as well is difficult. So, you know, who do you take from the Dragons region? Do you take Pontypool, who are, are up and comers and would feel a bit frustrated having worked so hard to get back up into the top level of, of, of the Welsh Premiership to not be then part of this new competition would be frustrated. I think... There are lots of questions still to answer. It seems to be, you know, six months down the line. Um, uh, I, I think the, the the communication has been made to some extent to the clubs, but perhaps hasn't been as open as it should have been, in my opinion. Um, because I think not putting that criteria out as clearly, not showing the panel, not you know extending the time period and things like that it's all become a bit messy um a bit messier than i think it should have been if you want to regenerate the game perhaps don't declare it on the eve of the start of the season is another point to make um i think there are lots of lots of points that um were not the smartest but um hopefully things will get smoothed out and things can can be um agreed upon because at the moment if you take those three clubs out we'll see what happens with Cardiff obviously in the rags but if you take those three clubs out then it's it's, it's a bit difficult to work out who those 10 teams are going to be yeah I said I mean it goes back to that problem that you know came up in the in the latest WLU report one of the big issues is communication and here we go there's an issue of communication again I'm not saying it's just the WLU I used to work at the University of Exeter they had a report where it said one of the biggest failures of communication and they were really crap with the communication of the results of this report, of that report. So, I mean, it, it is a big company thing. <clears throat> yeah. But it is frustrating. Uh, I, I, I said, I think until we hear a bit more about it, it's all a bit he said, he said she said, until we get some nice confirmed statements from WRU or clubs involved. Yeah. Um, um, oh, sorry, go on. I was, I was going to say about the positives from the weekend, which was only what... Um, which was the Cardiff one, the Rag one on the weekend, um, quite convincingly so as well, against Neath, who obviously had a bit of a bounce back, but uh, they won 35-17 down at the Knoll. Uh, Bridgend took the win against Pontypridd in the Celtic Warriors derby, which was 
obviously a, a very touching moment for them. Obviously, they were uh, paying tribute to JPR Williams after his passing two weeks ago, and a uh, number of his, of his ex players, or well, fellow ex players, were, were were there. And um, a brilliant game. I think Pontypridd were very close to getting the victory there, but unfortunately just missed a few kicks at the end. And uh, Bridgen took it fifteen points to thirteen, but. Yeah, unfortunately, also uh, Merthyr couldn't play uh, because of a frozen pitch at Pontypool. Those were the those were the weekend games in the Indigo Prem. All right, so I suppose we best um, talk the elephant in the room. So we are officially out of Europe now. To no one's no one's real surprise. Um, so we we lost forty eight twenty six to Racing ninety two in the in the Disco Dome with the weird kickoff time. Um. Well, probably the kickoff time everyone wants Saturday at quarter past three, but it just feels wrong for the venue. What are, you, what are your overall thoughts on the game? Um, well, it's difficult, difficult to sum to that really simply. Uh, my my initial, I want, I don't want to say threw it away because that simplifies it a little bit too much. Um, but I think. My my main feeling is if you work so hard to keep the score down to twenty twelve at half time, which Cardiff did brilliantly so, and it has been a habit of Cardiff conceding last minute tries at the end of the first half or points at the end of the first half. Look at Harlequins and how that costs you. Don't then throw it away with three cheap tries in the first ten minutes of the second half. And that's my and that is I. I, I can't get away from that. Yes, it's negative, I know. We'll talk about the positives later in the game at the start of the game, but those tries are too cheap, too easy. Um, starting off with, you do something that Cardiff don't really do, which is play from their own half, uh, playing from their own 22, lose the ball. Reese Carey does brilliantly um, to, to re, re, uh, save the situation and takes out the goalpost in, in doing so, which... If you haven't seen doing the rounds on Twitter, please do. And then Thomas Williams needs to find touch. It's a really simple, brilliant bit of skill from Tadda to keep it in and then beat a couple of defenders to score. But that needs to be off the park. Likewise, then switching off when there's a penalty in midfield, everyone sort of handy pots in, draws the defence in, and then it's easy, easy to spread the ball out to Christian Wade, who performs a bit of magic and Tom Foolery and makes does does make a kicker out of um that's not saying, but it does it does an amazing gradient kicker in the corner and uh, with some hoodwink, and then turning the ball over for the third try. And it's it's it was just too easy. I, I that was my frustration. Is if you watch that game back uh, as I did, so I, I I sort of watched the first half and then I was tra- I was driving and then had to go back and watch the second half. I was going back for the tries initially. Each one of those tries starts with Cardiff in possession. And it was just a bit frustrating. Uh, I think that's I think that's the word for the season, isn't it? Frustrating at, at points, but there are so many positives around that. It was just I felt maybe maybe saying an opportunity gone begging is a bit strong because I think Racing probably were the well, were the strongest side and would have won that regardless. But still, it was it was too too simple to give away. It it, it is one of those really weird ones because like for me. We scored three. Was it they scored two tries in the first in like the last twenty minutes, and then another three in those sets. So it's only a half hour block really where we got blown away. Yeah, and you know, as I said the one thing I thought that killed us in the Harlequins game was conceding that last minute try, and we thought right, we 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 stopped it. Great, we can kill out firing and get on. And then it just, and then we let in with that soft try, mm. and then it was like we. We're too shell shocked until about the fifty first, fifty second minute, and then we went, "Oh, hang on, no, wait a minute, we've got to defend." And actually, yeah. that we only let we only let one more in from there. Yeah, you know, we scored two decent ones ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought when ball was going to hand, the attack looked really good. I, I said, oh. "This, you know, this, I'm I, I'm going to carry on banging the drum for um, having Carry and Tamani on the pitch together as long as possible because that gives us go forward." Because if you if one if one's just gone into contact, the other one's ready to go, and we've got a big powerful carrier there. Ben Thomas at twelve just gives us a dimen- some extra dimensions of attack, which I think you know I th- I think because he's that different he's... player and he's more of a playmaker to Halahol, it does allow De Beer to be a little bit more aggressive and carry a little bit more, and that helped. And, you know, but then we can still keep shape. 
And again, that gives our midfield a lot more of direction. I thought Alex Mann had another fantastic game until he went off. Um, actually, I thought our bench was overall was fantastic. I thought it worked really well. Kudos to his carry after sending a post off for HIA to, uh, you know, doing putting in a decent 72 minute shift. He probably should have gone on about five minutes earlier, I think. I think you could say, see there was a right towards that last sort of 65, 70 minute, you could see he was really struggling. But I, I, I get it because you've got Reese Barrett on the bench. He's only really played Bragg's level, then bring them up. But you know, that's a sign of where we are. You know, ne- this time next season, I think Reese Barrett comes on a bit earlier and we probably don't concede that last try. They certainly don't concede the scrum penalty to get that last try. Um, yeah, um, Tamani was unbelievable when he came on. It was a shame it was at the expense of Big Mac. Oh, yeah. my oh, word, yeah. we have got to keep him. Ooh. I there's, there's something, it's almost Big Nick esque, and it almost, you know, where it's, 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 it's interesting you say that because a couple of weeks ago, I do remember sort of thinking it's it's almost inevitable that he's not going to stay. Oh, maybe yeah. it was me. Oh no, I think I I, I agree. I, he probably is, but oh, God, it was just the turnovers he was getting. It just reminded me so yes. many times of the like peak Nick Williams, where it's like we need a moment, and he just sort of comes pilfers the ball, clean turnover, and then we're yeah. up. So, and I think that's it is something we do as great as our sevens are. I think other than Thomas Young, most of them will hold for the penalty as opposed to the clean turnover. I know Alex Jenkins does it occasionally, but I do think. Although we don't get many penalties that way, it helps. Being, you know, it helps because we're actually getting true transition ball because you get a really nice clean presentation. <laughs> and because Tamani's so long, you you know it's that long. You know he almost forms that long rook for you, and the ball's away. Um, I thought defense overall, apart from that sort of half hour gap, I thought was mostly a lot better. You know, I said keep them keep them that line and the line out was 100%, but still a little bit wobbly, so it wasn't clean. They were very quick to sack Rory Thornton. Mm. But at least we were getting the platform, which is something we haven't had in a lot of other games. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I back everything you said, to be honest. I thought, yeah, like you said, the bench was superb. Um, and Ben Thomas, I thought, yeah, he's starting to look like a proper player. Um, starting to look like, uh, uh, actually, I... I Correct that. Starting to look like the player that he looked like two or three seasons ago. Mm. He sort of came on the scene, looked like he was going to be a big prospect, had a little bit of an iffy spell, which is understandable for a young player. And he's come back stronger for it. And he's clearly reveling in this, um, I don't want to say freedom, but the, the almost uh, the trust that Matt Sherrod's putting in him. Um, I think he's he, he looks he looks like he could be well, in, in it for the long haul for Cardiff and, and a real good player for a long time, which is, is great to see. Um, yeah, I I think that there were so many positives from this European campaign, though. When we, you know, we're talking about Cardiff being knocked out and that it was inevitable, but I think a lot of people saw Cardiff being whipping boys and I don't think that was the case. I don't think, you know, the Toulouse result was... Not great, let's be honest about it. It was a bit of a humbling, to say the least. But the performance... But look at everyone else. Yeah, that's that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is the performance wasn't actually as bad as perhaps the scoreline suggests. Again, cheap tries given away, but that was one thing. The Bath performance, that should have been a win. I think that's the that's the frustration and that's the hindsight, is it should have been a win from the position they were in. Uh, Harlequins, yeah. No, we've that said that right tough, I think, for me. That second half was, that one off. Second half performance was a write off. The first half in the game, last minute try that I don't think should have been, but that's by the by. And then a performance against Racing where at times Cardiff were as good, if not better, than Racing, but gave away cheap tries. I think I think it's there's clearly the we can see the shoots of a great team there. It, there is the shoots of a great team. It's just getting rid of the daft errors. And I do think some of them are schoolboy. And that's the mm. probably the frustration that you look at, you know, switching off from a penalty in midfield. That's a schoolboy error. That's a mistake where you go, come on, lads, you'd know better than this. But 
I think there's other bits of the game where there needs to be a bit more streetwise, bit more, bit more understanding of how to to win at this level. Um, but that'll come, and when it does, it's going to be a good team and an exciting team to watch. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I said it's a, it's, it's nice when we agree on things. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice when we can be positive. But um, yeah, yeah. It, I think yeah, shame shame they're out of Europe, but. Yeah, as you say about you know Toulouse Harlequins and things like that, but look at how Harlequins humbled Ulster as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's no, no, no. Um, well, I, no... Just, I mean, just talk about some of the players we've, you know, some of the players we, you know, we've had because obviously it's Champions Cup, it's the elite of rugby. You know, you've got two. Or the English sides are on a are on more than us, but probably not by much. But you, you look at some of the players. So you've got Sia Khaleesi, two time box captain. Will Rowlands, Wales International, probably our best player of the last three seasons. Um, Finn Russell, who, you know, everyone thinks is amazing, you know, unbelievable. And Trevor Neocane, you know, a World Cup winning prop. <laughs> You've got Alex Dombrandt, you know, Russell, uh, uh, Marcus Smith, uh, Dupont, Tommy Ramos, so, you know, so, you know, likes to show by that uh, Rowan Telfi. Yeah. Like, you know, a veritable who's who of the people who, you know, would, you know, quite often are on the level of making World 15 of the year or the Six Nations 15 of the year. You know, and it's not to say we don't have quality in star players, it's just a lot of them are injured at the time as well. Yeah. You know, like, our, you know, our, you know, our biggest, our two biggest players are, you know, in terms of like brand the most recognised, both Lupe Falato and Josh Adams haven't, you know, Falato has been injured all season, Josh Adams barely played. Yeah, through injury, you know, and that you know that's 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 the level we're at. You know, we can see where we need to go, and it's quite for me. It was quite good seeing. Apart from probably the Toulouse game, I didn't feel we were too far below. Too far below, like the Quinns game, I feel was just more of a write-off performance where we just everything went wrong. That was it. It it was just yeah, ignore this. But like I thought against Racing, you know, for the most part, we we were toe to toe. For Bath, as you said, we should have won. Maybe in another word, and you know, another day would have won. But the fact that we, you know, we're we're toe to toe, and in the league, where, you know, in in the league we haven't, you know, we've picked we either won or we've picked a bonus point. Unfortunately, it's more of losing bonus points than winning. But the other big pro- um, positive for me in the Racing game is we we got. A, we got a try scoring bonus point, which is only our third this season, fourth, third or fourth this season. Weirdly, though, fourth highest tries in the URC, which shows just shows how skewed that Dragons game was. <laughs> but then a lot of games we've been three tries, well, we've just not quite got that fourth. And I'm hoping that with the Racing game as well, it's showing it's hopefully going to be the start, the end of this trend where we unbelievable for the first half hour and then just and then it tails off mm. so you know if we can keep you know if, if we can keep getting closer and closer to that 80 minute performance but still playing the way we want to play then you know I think that there are going to be a lot of teams that will struggle to beat with us yeah completely and I think you, you speak of all those great players and I think if you're looking at a Teddy Williams, for instance, if you're looking at an Alex Mann, I don't think they've looked out of their depth. Um, no. I think, not, not. I thought Will Rollins was superb on the weekend as a as a mm. buy, which is great for Wales and anyone and anyone you know looking forward to seeing him in the Six Nations and maybe maybe did show where Teddy can improve a bit more in just offering himself maybe a bit more as that first carrier a little bit. That may be something that can work on, but. I thought, um, you know, as well, Cam, when he's played, has been brilliant in, in Europe, hasn't looked out of his depth. The beer, I think, has stepped up in Europe at another level in the majority of his games. I think he's performed at a higher level, perhaps, than than I'd seen in some of the URC games, particularly against Bath, where he was superb, but he was also very good against Toulouse. Um, and Ben Thomas as well is, is another one to mention. So it's not it's not like these players are getting blown out of the water or... Um, are looking like fish out of water, for instance, at the level that's above them. I think as a collective team, perhaps, it's a, a, it was a step too far, but I don't think it was a step too far for individuals, which once everything clicks, I think will be a good thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, one name that I didn't mention when we were talking about the game and talk is um, I thought Jacob Beetham was unbelievable at fifteen again. So I, I, you know, if we can keep both him and Cam, that battle's just going to be fun for the next so much fun for the next few years. Or if we're going to see Beetham a bit more at twelves or on our bench option, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's great to have one player who's you know brilliant in the spot, but having a second player who's constantly pushing him is just going to make everything you know. I think one of the greatest things we've had over the past couple of years is Thomas and Lloyd battling yeah. that nine jersey. And, you know, although Thomas cemented himself as the main starter, there were games where he'd flip around and you'd have Lloyd, particularly in like when you go to like the wet and wildly areas of um, Galway and stuff, and, you know, you can just use Lloyd Williams to just kick us out of trouble. And then Thomas comes on the last 10, 15 minutes for that moment of magic you need. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. I think, I think. Cam is definitely the guy in the box seat. Um, but you'd expect that from a guy uh, when he's competing against a guy who's missed a of year of rugby. So um yeah. I I I think I think Jacob needs a run of games somewhere. And if you can get two or three games, that'd be great because and it, it in a weird way, it may be the best thing for well, I mean, not in a weird way, but I think Cam getting selected for Wales may be one of the best things that happens to Jacob in that he gets that opportunity to play week in, week out, play three or four games straight off the bat and get used to playing in this in the, this high level because I think he's still missing that a little bit. That's my thing on Jacob. But he looks, you know, he's one hell of a physical specimen to be playing at fullback. You know, the size of him, he's got a boot on him. I know they kicked one out on the full against Racing, but he does have a good boot on him. And he can goal kick as well, something... Um, I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago when I went down to watch Cardiff, which watching him warm up and goal kick in the in the warm up. So um, hopefully we see that in the future as well. Yeah, I mean, let's be fair. As Cardiff fans know better than anyone, you can never have too many goal kickers. <laughs> oh, that is painful. You never know. It's, it's still too soon. It's still too soon to talk it about. It will always be too soon. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah, just really exciting. I think this is one thing where you know, you know, careful what you wish for with the whole not having games during international windows because obviously we're not going to be, we won't be in action now until the seventeenth of February when we host Connacht. Which mm. again, I want everyone. Let's get going. It's always a great game against Connacht. You know, it's always a nice open game. We've got a really good home record against them, and I think you know the crowd is a big part of that. And I think you know if we can nail that down. So I'm going to be pushing this every week now. Is get get them to cap for Connacht. So I said, you know, will probably have a go. You know, so Beetham will probably get the nod at 15 for that one, and then on the game in sort of March, where I believe we're away to Glasgow, third of March. I can double check um, that. You see, they're either third of March or it's the. Glasgow's either that March rest week or the or it's the first one straight after the Six Nations when we're not going to have our, we're probably not going to have our internationals for those three games. Second of March, uh, home to Leinster. Oh, cool! So we have got two Irish home, both our Irish home games. Well, it's it's really this is where the format and the well, rugby calendar really annoys me. Because imagine now we didn't have Europe. Mm. Well, we had Europe, but we put it say we put the whole thing after Six Nations. We've got those four weeks in January. All right, maybe keep the third so that one. What was I thinking? If you've got the two weeks before Christmas and then the four weeks in January, that's another six games. That takes us up to 15. So we'd only have three games of the season left of the regular season URC. Then you have the six nations. And then you could have that. You could have Europe, then your last three games. And then, and then you've got a run. At least you've got a constant run. Because I think that's one thing a lot of people complain about is when you get to this half of the season, the home, your home games are so sporadic anyway. So we've only got nine, but they're dispersed amongst... So, you know, I think we've got four in this spot, but the four games dispersed amongst nine URC games. Plus you've got the weeks for Europe knockouts, plus the Six Nations. And you just like... So those four games get diluted into about four months. And just like... I, get, I, I do see a point, um, but... It's... It, it, the, the... <sighs> There's so many issues with the rugby calendar. I can't get yeah. started. That's I mean, the thing. I think this Until... season is weirder as well with yeah. rugby world cup, etc. But yeah, I said until we can sort of get it all. I said, I mean, 
New Zealand fans don't realise how lucky they've got it because they've got their big pro competition. So, you know, you've got the five super rugby sides, they play that. Then they, then the, the, the All Blacks then go, all the ones who are good enough to be in the All Blacks or Maori All Blacks, they then go off and they'll play, they'll have their summer tournaments warm up, then they have the rugby championship, then they have the autumn to finish off. In the meantime, then, any super rugby player who doesn't go into the All Blacks goes down into a provincial thing, so it splits the wages. It's why it's the reason I think that that system works. Mm. Imagine now, like, kind of basically only had to pay for the URC and Europe, say, and then those players went off, and then you know you split in between. So then, the Premiership then are getting, you know, URC level players filtered through, and then you've got an extra thing there whilst the internationals are going on. So you're not going to have clashes. You, you know, you're not going to be missing. You know, the players who become your best players are playing because the internationals are away. I mean, that's kind of the whole idea of the EDC, isn't it? So playing those four weeks in November and the Six Nations. But it's just like, oh, it could just be... The fact that we have, you know, Cardiff don't play now until start of Feb, until mid-Feb, then it's March. And then there'll be spread it gaps around because we've got the European knockouts, which, well, unfortunately we're not part of, but I mean, you, I don't think you should ever hedge your season on the hedge your bets on knockout rugby. Not now, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 that. Um, I, I am planning to go to Connacht if, if I'm not working, which is a bizarre way of saying things, but yeah, um, I'm hoping, hoping to go down to see uh, Cardiff against Connacht, so uh, definitely fill the cap and Hopefully a great game there. Um, and then Leinster in a couple of weeks and we know we know what Cardiff can do against Leinster at home, which is exciting to see. Um, I was going to mention about something about hoping to keep ball off by half, but I feel like I'm touching wood too much. So I'm <laughs> just everyone stay fit for the Cardiff game because uh, I don't want to see another situation where we're trying to draft in different players to play fly half again. I said all, all our fly halves, Dina's could be it. Yes, that? I mean, but... from all accounts, Arbol's been playing pretty well for the Rags, so he's at least getting regular game time. As it... going back to my frustration, I would like to have whether it's a Harry World or whatever. I mean, at some point, I feel do feel like Sharrock's got to go. Do you know what? De is as bedded into this system as it as it's going to get. Mm. This season's right off. Let's get the number two guy in because you know it was enough of a scare when De Beer was injured. You know, earlier on this month. I really don't want to be thinking. Oh fuck, who have we got? Yeah, I, I I do agree. You know, you see it in American football where you bring in your second quarterback just to have a few snaps of the ball and that sort of thing. I think that would be not that I've just started watching American football since Louis moved over, but it sort of sounds like that. But the it'd be nice to see your second ten, whoever that be, be it Ben Thomas, be it. Uh, Ardwell, be it Harry Wilde even, uh, having an, a bit of a go at the 10 jersey. I think that's something that I've spoken about for a while. But on the flip side of that, I don't think Sherrett's had many opportunities where he can say I can rest the beer. And that would be his his thing to say, is that they've never been in a point, apart from Toulouse and Harlequins, where they're out of the game and he can rest the beer without risking a loss that they could have possibly turned around. So, um, yeah. That's that's the flip side of that. I said for me, I think it just depends on when we get to you know, what point do we say the season is effectively over? Because really, if you're not top eight, it doesn't really matter. You're you're playing Challenge Cup rugby. Yeah. That's a crapshoot. Like if you get if you get teams I mean, I still don't know how we've ended up with so many into URC toys in the Challenge Cup. It, that that baffled me. And the fact that not that of we had three Welsh teams in the Challenge Cup and not a single one of them tied with an English team seems really weird to me. But I don't make the scheduling. And it's... I, look, looking at looking at it though, I, I am seeing the possibility of twenty to twenty five points at the end of the season. You know, Connacht Connacht is is a winnable game. That's possible five pointer. Leinster at home kind of have won in the past, so you want to say. There's a possibility of nine points, even though Leinster are a strong side. Then you're going away to Glasgow, which is going to be tough. You're going away to Munster, but this kind of side has shown that they don't turn over easily and quite often get losing bonus points, even if they lose. So they'll be hopeful of that. You're then going away to Ulster as well. So, yeah, but Ulster haven't been consistent this season, neither of Munster. So both of those, you'd think, 
there's a chance of getting something. Then Edinburgh at home, and then you've got um, the trip to South Africa before Ospreys at home. I think there's there's all those home games are winnable. So I'd like to think that um, Cardiff still have aspirations of the top eight. It's unlikely, severely unlikely. Um, so maybe maybe see where we are at after the end of the island fixtures and the end of those. That that'll be my that'll be my saying. But then, do you want to shove a young ten into playing out in Glasgow, Ulster, and Munster and or South Africa? Not really. So it's there's two ways of looking at it, isn't it? I think the thing to me is it, you're looking at ten wins. So I'm bon- it's ten wins and bonus points to get into top eight realistically mm. we're on three and we've got nine games left and two of those are south africa and uh, that's that's where i start going right we've got four away games or well, five away games and it's like and two of them in south africa our one home games judgment day which we won last year I don't think it's good. The way the pitch is going to be anywhere near as bad as it was at right, Regen, right, at Regen, so because of the deluge. So I think you know, the physical, you know, the, the massive pack won't be as much of a factor. I said oh, this is just me where I where we show that you know you are actually the optimistic one of the two of us. <laughs> I, I look. I think it's unlikely, massively unlikely. I'm just I'm just saying, don't don't say no yet. Is what I'm no. saying. Don't don't call the season off yet. Um, but I think it's very unlikely. I think Ospreys are probably the, the favourites of the Welsh regions, and they've got a tough run in. So I think it's going to be hard for both both Cardiff and uh, and Ospreys to get into the top eight, and hopefully one does. Um, just just because it'd be really nice to to prove a point in that sense, but also to get in that top eight would be brilliant for the future of Welsh rugby in next season. Yeah, absolutely. I think Ospreys though, are quite lucky in the fact they've got um basically, you know, they've they don't have that many to the Wales squad because of injuries. And they're all due to come back over these big games. So that yeah. might actually that might actually swing in their favour. Maybe, maybe. But as Hugh Griffin, the neg- the massive negative person, was to point out that Ospreys have only played two games outside of Wales in the URC so far this season. Then I counted with well, we've only played one. <laughs> I think that's just because he's trying to make himself feel better about the Scarlets and their horrid, you know, their horrid fixtures at the start of the season. Yeah. Um, well. So, I mean, I think we've done Cardiff and European stuff to death. Um, maybe we'll try and find someone, you know, an ultra positive Cardiff fan to come and give their take on it next week, because we again, it'll only be uh, six nations really to talk about. Um. So I said we're not playing the first team aren't playing this week. So do you want to talk about the f- upcoming fixtures for um, of Cardiff interest? Yeah, uh, Indigo Prem uh, fixtures. You've got Cardiff at home to Bridgend. That's two thirty kickoff at Cardiff Arms Park. Um, also, uh, Pontypridd are at home at the same time to Pontypool. Um, Merthyr don't play this weekend, but. Um, we had a little bit of discussion pre-pod about that Cardiff fixture being at Cardiff Arms Park at half two because Gwalia Lightning uh, were supposed to be playing at half one on Saturday, but that's been moved to Sunday. Uh, they're playing at home to Edinburgh at the Cardiff Arms Park um, on Sunday. Um, and they're in a great position, have, being second in the table. Um, hopefully they can continue their good form, won two of their first three. So hopefully they can get a third win and possibly secure a place in those knockout stages. Uh, Brithon, on the other hand, are away at the Wolfhounds, who are top of the table, and that's a seven thirty kickoff. Still looking for their first win. That'll be a tough fixture for Brithon Thunder to to get that first win for certain. Um, but hopefully they can manage it out in Ireland. Um, but yeah, those are the main fixtures. Obviously, Cardiff Cardiff are still in a situation where they are fourth in the table um, in the Indigo Prem. They are, I think, five points, five or six points now um, ahead of uh, their nearest rivals, which are Pontypool. Um, so that is really good to see um, with, with the hope of getting in that top four. Yeah, six points ahead of Pontypool. Hope of getting that top four. Pontypool, the further four points back uh, to uh, just ahead of Merthyr. So all three Cardiff region teams have a good chance of getting in that top four. Um, although it is going to be a bit of a battle between all three of them, I think, to get that 
final place alongside uh, the likes of Sandovery, Evervale, and probably Newport. So yeah, so that, that's our that's our Premiership update. Just a reminder that the ranks games home games are on the Cardiff season ticket. So if you do find if you are missing a fix of rugby, feel free to join them. The Gwalior Lightning games, unfortunately, because they're not officially Cardiff, don't come under that. <laughs> but you know, either way, still go down and support it because the the Lightning have been playing some absolutely wonderful rugby at the moment. And uh, you know, uh, currently second in the Celtic Challenge table as far as I'm aware. So that's you know they're in a good stead to um. To uh, be in the top end of the knockouts as that comes around, I, I don't know the exact format. When we get close to the actual, the actual final stop, we'll uh, have a talk about it more. Yeah, yeah. There's a there is a knockout stage, but uh, as, yeah, I think most people are a bit confused about how it's going to work out. But yeah, they they look in uh, a good situation if they can get a win this weekend, especially. Yeah. I said to me, it looks like it's basically the top two teams will play the top two teams, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. They play a double header. And then whoever wins on aggregate goes. At least that's what it looks like to me. But it might be something completely different. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> about it, so I'll, I'll leave it to your uh, expert opinion. But yeah, I'll yeah. see, see how it turns out in a couple of weeks. I wouldn't go uh, call any of my opinions expert. Um, <laughs> so we're nearly, nearly coming to the end now because um, uh, you know the Ospreys got some bloke called Lance on tonight, so. Uh, so they've asked us to make way because you know they need a, an extra half hour to do the hair and makeup. Yeah, some some bloke called Lance. It's 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 it's. Uh, it, I was going to imply that it was another Lance, but I won't do that for libel reasons. But yeah, <laughs> I was trying to think of any other famous Lances, and the only one I could think of was not the one I want to compare him to. <laughs> no, Lance, Lance, Lance uh, yeah. So look, Lance Bradley, new CEO, is uh, joining Osprey Diary. <laughs> In possibly the worst kept secret we've been holding within the pods, so you know <laughs> that's uh David Buttress. So we've had David Buttress, Simon Mudrak, Lance Bradley, now on, um, Anthony, blah, 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 uh, the communications manager for Ospreys, you know. So, um, um, if if Dicky, if uh, Richard Holland or Alan, if either of you two want to come on and voice your opinions and correct anything you've heard out in the media, again, you're more than welcome to come and come and speak to us. Um, and then all I want to do is just another uh, another shameless shameless begging of if you're enjoying the podcast, please please review, leave likes, comments. Uh, it all makes it all helps us. Uh, watch us on YouTube because that help and subscribe on the YouTube channel, which is Rap Podcast, which annoys me because it's podcast podcast. But Lee tells me to shut up every time I bring it up. And you obviously you can follow us on. At Cardiff underscore Central on X, and um, we're also on Facebook under the Cardiff Central podcast. And we don't have an official thing on Blue Sky, but I'm on there at Harley dot Worthy at Blue Sky. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so you know, if you want to get in touch with me, get in touch with us on there. Feel free to message. Um, if you are going to de- uh, message us through Facebook or Twitter, if you message the pod channel correctly, because it just means both of us can see a lot easier, a lot quicker and easier. And uh, any other messages you want to get out there before coming? Any pieces up and coming? No, I've uh, well, Will, we've got the blog for the rap. Is probably the other thing to mention is that we're starting up that, and there's a few ideas in the works. Um, I've got a couple along with Yestin that we're thinking about doing. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing for me to plug as yet. Um, yeah, still in the uh, various various stages of uh, deciding what I want to do with the rest of my life. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, that's always a fun part of your life. Um, so <laughs> all it leaves me to say is to thank you all for listening. And then I'd like to thank uh, my co-host, Carwin, as ever, is putting up with me and pushing the buttons. <laughs> that is my job, yeah. Pushing the buttons and uh, putting up with you. Yeah, I, I deserve a pay rise for that second part, I think. Yeah, you can have 100% pay rise. <laughs> right, uh, so... That's that's all. So until next week, ta-ra. Bye-bye.